Thank you, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so to start today's session, uh, I'm going to talk about something that uh, has become a bit of a buzzword. I'm going to talk about software supply chain. Uh, what's uh, the software supply chain? Well, it's a, a fairly simple uh, concept. We all use other people's code. Uh, modern uh, software development practices involve uh, using third-party software that is made available through the open source uh, uh, ecosystem. And um, we, we take that software, and instead of reinventing the wheel for every project, for every company, uh, we depend on, uh, we import these third-party software as dependencies. Uh, this, of course, has a number of advantages, uh, and <clears throat> of course, in terms of uh, efficiency, and in terms of uh, also robustness in many cases. Nobody here wants to write their own cryptography, no one wants to write their own HTTP stack, their own database, their own metric system, their own logging. And I'm sure everybody thought, wait, no, I want to, I want to implement my own, or at least one of these, but not all of them at the same time. So the point is, we use dependencies. We use third-party software. However, with uh, dependencies uh, come a number of risks uh, that have led to a number of high-profile uh, breaches uh, over time. These are all uh, uh, somehow failures in the software supply chain. Uh, we talk about the supply chain as that uh, system and uh, steps and people that get software from the third parties where it's developed uh, all the way into our applications, into our uh, software, into our products. Um, now, different breaches, uh, however, have had uh, different causes and involved different play, and there are different players involved in securing those steps of the supply chain. I'm going to talk about three major players in securing the software supply chain. The first one is the language itself. The language provides uh, the, the mechanics through which we import dependencies and through which we uh, delegate trust to them. The ecosystem is the set of open source software and people that actually provide this software. And then finally, there's you, there's the organization, there's the final consumer of the software. Each of these uh, uh, player has a number of, of responsibilities. And we're gonna talk about the problem that uh, each of uh, these uh, players has to solve, both in general, and we'll talk about uh, how Go specifically solved them. There's two reasons I'm going to talk about how Go solves them. One is that it's my job, but the other one uh, is that Go uh, had the advantage of shipping a solution after looking at how everybody else had solved it, uh, how problems had developed, and what new technology was available. Uh, Go introduced a dependency management, a native dependency management solution in 2018 with Go modules. And at that point, uh, we had the, the privilege to look at everything that happened before uh, to decide how to solve these problems. So let's start by talking about what the language needs to do. The language enables uh, all the trust that is involved in the supply chain. Uh, it has three roles. It has to uh, pro uh, mm, solve provenance. That, that is, what code are we even running? Do we know the version? Do we know the source? Uh, is it going to be available in the future? And do we know that it has not been tampered with? First one, uh, I stole a word from the uh, ar archival uh, community, but provenance is just a fancy way of saying that we need a universal name for dependencies so that two different companies, two different uh, uh, developers, two different machines can agree on what software they need to run. And a permanent version. Permanent is key. Version 1.2.3 can't change meaning over time. If we want a chance at securing everything that we build on top of dependencies, we first need to agree on what exactly a dependency is. This is sold uh, in other ecosystems, uh, usually approximately the same way. For example, Python has the PyPy, what they affectionately call the cheese shop. Um, and uh, tools like pipenv that fetch packages from the namespace of the PyPy. Uh, and then there are uh, usually log files that specify the exact version that you're using in your project. By the way, it's critical to check these log files into your uh, version control system because without them, you, uh, 
two different uh, parties running the code can't agree on what the dependencies are, the build is not reproducible, and there is nothing to be done in terms of assessing the security of the rest of the stack. Go, however, solved this a little differently. Go did away with the distinction between uh, a file that specifies what dependencies uh, you want and their version ranges, and uh, the log file that specifies the actual versions. Go uses uh, an algorithm uh, called uh, minimum vers version selection, which means that for each dependency, uh, you specify the minimum version that will work for you. For example, the one that introduced the API you need. And then, uh, it assumes that if any transitive dependency needs a higher version of the same major version, since semantic verse versioning is enforced at the ecosystem level, it's going to work just selecting the higher one. So even if here we say that we want version 1.2.0, if something else in the tree requires version 1.4.0, that's what's gonna get used. And it's guaranteed to be backwards compatible because semantic versioning. If there is a backwards compatibility break, uh, the major version gets bumped, and the two major versions can be used at the same time. That could be a whole token in itself, and dependency management is its own uh, uh, field. Uh, but what I care about here is that uh, it, as soon as we know the minimum versions of each uh, module, we know exactly what versions of each module we are going to use. So this solves provenance for us. It also has another advantage. You might notice that uh, these are not uh, just arbitrary names like, I don't know, uh, logging. Uh, they are domain names uh, with paths. Uh, that also tells us where to find the code. The Go module ecosystem is a decentralized ecosystem where the name of the module tells you also how to fetch it at the same time. This has the advantage that there is no risk of, I don't know, the crypto package becoming out of date and uh, unmaintained. Uh, but still used because it's called crypto, um, and uh, allows us um, <clears throat> uh, and allows us uh, to avoid tracking logins for the registry, which is its own risk. The second problem that the language tooling needs to solve is that of availability. Basically, th this is an often overlooked property of security. Uh, it's not just about making sure that uh, attackers can't change what you're gonna do but it's also making sure that they can stop you from deploying. And the problem with availability became very clear with the left pad incident, which became kind of infamous. When one developer withdrew, withdrew a package of 11 lines and half of the language ecosystem collapsed because everything that depended on it could not build anymore because there was no process in place to ensure that tomorrow that module and that, that package and that version is still going to be available. The goal solution here is uh, that there is a proxy protocol specified for, uh, that allows you to fetch modules. This proxy protocol is implemented by the Go modules mirror, which is operated by Google. And um, we, uh, as long as the license of a certain module is, allows redistribution, we will hold on the con to the contents so that even if they get deleted by the upstream author, they will still be available for you to build. But you may say you don't want to depend on Google even for the availability of your code. The proxy protocol is an open protocol. So the interesting uh, thing to companies here is that they can run their own proxy, which will cache everything that has ever been used at the organization, and guarantee within the organization that everything will still be available in the future for as long as the internal infrastructure is accessible. However, this brings us to the next issue, which is integrity. Uh, if there are proxies in the middle, how do we guarantee that the content hasn't been tampered with? Uh, this is usually solved again with log files that contain hashes of the dependencies, but we wanted to solve a little further than that uh, when we designed our solution. Uh, we wanted a solution that had uh, allowed uh, us not to trust proxies, but also allowed us to have no trust in a central entity, whether that's a registry or whether that's the proxy operator. And that had no trust on first use. So when you first generate the log file, you need to get that checksum, that hash from somewhere. And currently, uh, in most ecosystems, you just trust whoever you're getting that hash from, whether that's the registry or the author. And finally, we wanted to introduce no key management uh, requirements for authors, because we know that that never gets adopted. Let's be honest here. So 
Our solution uh, is the Go Checksum database. It was designed by uh, Russ Cox and me, and the core idea is to uh, solve, is everyone looking at the same code instead of uh, solving, is this the right code? Uh, solving the question of, is this the original code, requires a relationship with the author. But if instead we solve for, is everyone in the world looking at the same code when they want version 1.2.3 of module foo, as long as everybody's looking at the same code, does it, at that point the problem is solved. Because if that everybody includes the author, we solved the problem. And anyway, there is no way to make targeted attacks on your organization, on your project, uh, because everybody's looking at the same code. Now, the easiest way to solve this would be to say, all right, let's trust a central authority, and that central authority will keep track of the hashes of everything, and uh, we'll ask it, hey, is this the correct hash, and is this what everybody's looking at? Now, that's a starting point, but the problem is that that, again, introduces trust into a central uh, authority. So what we did is that we took the technology of a certificate transparency uh, to provide accountability on top of that service. Uh, the Go team operates such a service, the checksum database, where you can ask, is this the same checksum that everybody else is seeing for this module version? But at the same time, the client will automatically verify Merkle tree proofs uh, that guarantee that this answer came from an append-only log of all the checksums of all the module versions. And this is a public log that can get audited by, by people, as well as uh, getting verified for append-only properties and for inclusion properties every time the client fetches it. This is the difference from CT in that client, the Go client verifies the actual cryptographic proofs at every operation, every time it interacts with the checksum database. There are no intermediary uh, signed timestamps involved. And finally, we uh, devised a way to serve this tree in uh, cacheable tiles. Um, we split this tree into tiles that are more cacheable because this allows us to serve the entire tree with uh, no dynamic endpoints at all. Uh, normally, the, the cryptographic proofs require uh, a dynamic endpoint where you tell it, hey, I know about this tree and I want the proof for this thing. Instead, we break the, t the tree into tiles, the client does most of the computation, and then requests what are essentially static assets that can get cached, proxied, and mirrored by organizations uh, so that they don't have to disclose what they actually are looking up to the upstream. So organizations can run entire copies of the checksum database with nothing else than very simple static uh, uh, hosting systems. So to recap, the Go checksum database is a public append-only log of all module version checksums. It's kept accountable by Merkle tree proofs verified on the client, and it's served as cacheable tiles so that it can be proxied and uh, mirrored within organizations. My favorite thing about this system is that it, it works perfectly uh, on top of a decentralized ecosystem, and it requires no UX cost, neither on the consumer side nor on the author side. We uh, enabled this by default for modu uh, Go modules in 2019, and it just rolled out to everyone that was using Go modules, both publishing and uh, consuming them, without them doing anything. And it's currently live. So this is what the language has to do for you uh, to enable the uh, supply chain to be secure. Next, uh, on top of this tooling, the ecosystem will develop and will build trust relationships. Uh, this is the ecosystem of actual uh, software dependencies. Why are the trust relationships important? Every time you uh, import a new dependency and every time you update an existing dependency in your project, you delegate a degree of trust to that dependency and to its transitive dependencies. A health ecosystem will see this as a liability. A health ecosystem will fight the trust uh, dependencies like it, it fights uh, technical debt. Why is this a liability? Because, uh, for example, if any uh, uh, element down the chain gets compromised, that leads to a compromise of your uh, system. This is um, a, a recent high-profile uh, breach where a library event stream uh, got Atta um, an attacker got control of it, introduced a new dependency, and that dependency targeted a specific consumer of that library, a cryptocurrency wallet, because of 
course, cryptocurrency. Um, uh, and uh, proceeded to steal the um, uh, money from the wallets of the five end users. So this is why one of the things I'm most uh, happy about the Go ecosystem is that it's core to the, uh, to the philosophy of the language that a little copying is better than a little dependency. This is one of Rob Pike's uh, original Go proverbs. And the idea is that uh, you don't want to introduce uh, a de trust dependency uh, when the advantage brought by reusing a third-party third -party code is uh, not more than the cost of introducing a new trust link. When you make a copy, you take on the responsibility of maintaining that code. But if that code is small enough, that is significantly less than the cost of uh, the, the trust link that you impose on all your, uh, on everyone that also depends on your uh, library. And another, a little more technical thing I'm very happy about Go is that um, even if your, uh, um, your GoSum file might have a lot of modules in them, because a lot of modules are involved in deciding what the minimum version of each module should be, uh, only the ones that actually end up built uh, in your project actually have any chance to modify the behavior of your application or of the developer experience. That means that if I'm using a library and that library uses a third-party library for testing, that third-party library can't affect neither me nor my users because I'm not actually running the tests of my dependency and I'm not building uh, the tests into my application. So it shouldn't get uh, to modify the behavior of uh, my application. So these are the things that sit outside of uh, the control of the organization. These are things that need to be considered when it's time to decide what language and what ecosystem to rely on. And these uh, all set up a number of trust relationships that then the organization has to manage and mitigate. It is the job of the organization to be aware of them uh, and to uh, uh, mitigate their risk. The, the ways it does that are, uh, there are three major ways. One is tracking existing vulnerabilities. One is worrying about uh, what the future vulnerabilities will look like and how they will uh, get found. And the final one is auditing, of course, for current vulnerabilities. Vulnerability tracking is the most straightforward in that uh, there are public databases of vulnerabilities, uh, some more, some less structured, unfortunately. So there is work to be done here as a uh, industry to make this uh, information as accessible as possible. But uh, once vulnerabilities are public, it's important to have a process to get notified and install patches. Again, this is one of the most common failures and the one that led to the Equifax breach, where a month old vulnerability was used by attackers to get access to the system. Uh, normally, this, uh, this is solved by tools like NPM Audit, which is an um, excellent tool in the uh, Node ecosystem. And in Go, there are a number of community tools, uh, and we're working on a uh, native solution uh, to bring the, uh, this information to developers. Next, uh, an organization will want to look at security practices. That is, you want to ask yourself, when you pick up a new de uh, dependency, how are new vulnerabilities in this dependency going to get introduced? How are they going to get discovered, and how are they going to get handled? The things you want to look for are um, tests, uh, fuzzing, CI, the, the practices that will allow the uh, dependency, the project to protect itself. Uh, the security reporting processing, because you want this uh, dependency to have an established process uh, to learn about vulnerabilities and to handle them secretly and publish patches. Their maintenance status. If the project is not maintained, nobody's going to fix the vulnerabilities. And finally, even longer term, the sustainability of the project. Sustainability of dependencies is a security concern. If a project is a single person in their basement, they can stop working on it any day, and you will not have anybody to uh, ma uh, publish security patches anymore. This is something an organization can also contribute to, of course, by sponsoring projects. Uh, in Go, uh, we have a number of um, uh, tools to, of course, ensure the security of uh, projects, but we're also working on two things. We're working on bringing fuzzing into the ecosystem as a very easy to use uh, tool, and we're working on uh, surfacing all the signals on the uh, Go package discovery site 
uh, at package.go.dev, which hopefully will help organizations assess all these signals when selecting a new uh, dependency. And finally, there is, of course, auditing. The most expensive, the uh, most uh, effort uh, heavy, the least scalable uh, part of the entire story, which is that at the end of the day, when everything else uh, is, is done and the trust relationships are clear and you know the future direction of dependency, you might or might not have the resources to actually look at the actual lines of code you're depending on. But I believe that uh, that is often, uh, often you hear uh, advice that, oh, you should always be doing that. That's premature. Uh, you, you need to worry about everything else in the pyramid before you start spending uh, resources on actually auditing every single line of code. Um, and important, an important part that's often overlooked is that if you can reduce the trust dependencies, there are fewer things you actually need um, to audit in, at the end of the day. So this is it um, for me. I recommend looking at the Go Checksum database design document, in particular if you're involved in an ecosystem that uh, could want to bring some of the um, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> that may want to bring some of the details of that design into uh, your ecosystem. Uh, I also recommend reading uh, the essay by Russ Cox, Our Software Dependency Problem, which uh, looks at both uh, operational and security uh, point of view on uh, dependencies. And finally, if you want to learn more technically about the Go Checksum database, uh, there is a talk by Katie Hockman at last year's GopherCon. Uh, that explains uh, the, the life of a, uh, of a query of a module. Thank you very much, and uh, let me know if there are any questions.